I'm Steve Melvin, uh, Extension Educator. I'm based down in Central City and have worked in irrigation for a number of years. And when we start talking about nitrogen on an irrigated crop, we really need to think about irrigation being an integral part of that process of keeping the nitrogen where it belongs. You know, we can put on exactly the right amount of nitrogen and over irrigate and leach a bunch of that nitrogen away and have nitrogen deficient crops. And we look at that and we go, oh, I guess corn does use more nitrogen than I thought for. So next year you think maybe you need to put more on. But no, the mistake was that you put too much irrigation on. And so really figuring out from an irrigation scheduling perspective what the right amount of water to put on the field is really critical. And then, of course, when we get to fields like these that are, you know, have some different soil types and, and some other uh, things that are less than uniform, now all of a sudden we need to start thinking about can we put that water on at different rates? You know, can we put more on over here where, you know, maybe it's a sandier soil and, and uh, it doesn't hold quite as much. Maybe we put some a little bit less over here. Maybe we've got a wet area that's kind of sub-irrigated where we don't need to put as much on. And so what we want to spend our time today talking about is variable rate irrigation and that can be as simple as and and we'll go through some more of these definitions but you know a lot of the compu uh, computer panel uh, center pivots have been able to do where they can program them to speed up and slow down you can put different amounts of water on and kind of pie slice shapes around the field there's no cost to it if you've got that panel all you got to do is program it. but if you want to go ahead and put to where you can put a different amount of water in each different spot in the field then we need to spend some little bit more money and we're going to talk about both of those today so again that's what kind of what the focus is going to be here today is is what kind of some of the hardware we need a little bit but mostly focusing on how do we generate some maps and how do we think about that so and Derek Hewen and my research is conducted in another demonstration site in, in near Creighton and today I would like to share some uh, experience on working with a drone in my research so uh, the drone I use currently is Matrix 300 made by DJI and it can work under most of the weather conditions. Uh, the wind, the wind uh, resistance is up to 15 meters per second and uh, uh, the weather tolerance is between negative 20 degree to 50 degree and if the wind allows the uh, maximum flight duration is about 55 uh, minutes and typically the, it could mount up to two sensors on the drone platform and in our research currently we mounted uh, one uh, multi-spectral sensor on it named Altum and as we can see here on this sensor there are five cameras and how two black points could capture the thermal information so every time we take picture it can take five photos at the same time including the uh, blue light, green light, red light uh, near infrared, uh, red edge, and thermal information. So after we receive these photos, oh, so before every time we fly the drone, we need to create a flight plan for the drone. So as we can see here, the blue area is a field that we want to cover. And we put the uh, other settings such as the fly, uh, flight rate, flight height, and also the flight direction. So the system could automatically calculate the best route for us as the green line showed here. So when we fly the drone, we just send the plan to the drone and tell it, okay, follow this command. It could follow these green lines and finish the uh, flight automatically. And in this case, in this field, the total flight is about 23 minutes and it have to take like 535 photos to uh, actually took the photos 535 times uh, to make sure it could cover the whole field. So here is uh, the uh, video I made last time when we were trying to fly the drone. As we can see, the red uh, arrow indicates the real-time drone uh, location here. And we can also switch the view to the uh, front camera to observe what is happening in the sky. And also we can see from this view, uh, the flight speed of the drone is around 10 miles per hour and the flight altitude is about 400 feet uh, above ground. And after we receive the, all the raw images, we need to stitch them together. And the software we are currently use is named Pix4D Field. So it helps us uh, to put all the, info, um, in all the images together and produce a map as 
we list here. So uh, it's produce a map based on our de uh, demand. If we want to scout the field, we can ask it to produce an RGB map. And if we want to use it for the irrigation decisions, we usually use the NDVA map and thermal map. And in my study, we usually use the NDRE map to help us evaluate the uh, nitrogen sufficiency over the cone. And besides the application of the drone in the irrigation management and the fortigation management, there are also many application cases uh, of the drone, uh, such as the early stage uh, pesticide infection and also some uh, type of excess on the hail damage. And also it can predict the uh, yield on the beets. And we believe uh, the development of this technology could help us uh, with uh, on the better understanding of the precise uh, agricultural management. Hey, my name is Nate Dorsey. I'm an extension educator with the University of Nebraska. I'm based in Fremont. I cover both Dodge and Washington counties, so a, a little ways away, but I do have a background working in, in the irrigation space, uh, primarily with irrigation technology. So variable rate irrigation is, is kind of right up my alley. It's, it's something that I've worked with quite a bit over the years. So. I'm excited to talk about this and kind of connect the dots with some of the things that Jamie talked about with remote sensing and drones and how we can use tools like that to generate variable rate prescription maps uh, that we can send to uh, center pivot irrigation machines to then uh, uh, have them do that in the field. So, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what VR, VRI is or variable rate irrigation. And really what it allows us to do is to apply different amounts of water in different areas of the field based off of different characteristics that we have there. So that could be different soil types, that could be topography, that could be uh, known issues that we have in certain areas. So um, there's a few different, different methods that we can use or do with our center pivot, uh, center pivot machines to do this. The first is speed control, and that's varying the, the speed of the machine as it goes around the field. So if we go faster, it's going to apply less water uh, in certain areas of the field. If we slow it down, it'll, it'll, it will apply more. Uh, so that, that is a great uh, tool. All center pivot irrigation machines are capable of doing this uh, directly from the factory. So basically all pivots are, are, are capable of doing variable rate irrigation. Uh, the challenge though is that it, it only creates pie shaped slices. So big chunks of the field. Um, the other method is zone control. So this can be achieved in a few different ways. One is by controlling the each, each individual sprinkler. Um, that's, that's one method. Another is by having different zones along the machine. So we could have, you know, each span of the, of the pivot could be a zone. We could have, multiple, we could have like several different zones uh, per span. So we can set up a, a, few, a few different ways. And part of this is uh, driven by cost. So if we do more things like uh, individual sprinkler zone control or uh, variable rate irrigation, that tends to be just a little bit more expensive because we have more equipment. Um, and then if we do zones where we have, you know, on just each individual span or multiple zones per span, that tends to be a little bit less expensive because we, we have a little bit less equipment involved in that. Um, but then also we can generate prescription maps, and this is, this is key, that we can make a map that we want uh, the, the pivot to perform and send that to the machine, and it will do that uh, automatically as it goes around the field. Um, so that, may, that makes, it, makes it so that we're not having to control the machine or, or have someone stand there at the panel to do, to do something. So we'll talk a little bit how we can uh, generate some of these prescription maps in a little bit, but these are some visual examples of what these uh, types of prescriptions can look, can look like and the different capabilities of, the, of these machines. So if we do something with uh, speed control, for example, these are the pie-shaped slices that I'm talking about. So you basically can only, you're limited to, you know, you can set the, the amount of degrees around the circle that you want, um, and you can do, you know, pretty small slices. Uh, but you're really going from the, the outer edge of the field all the way to the to the inside to the to the uh, to the pivot point. If we do something more like zone control, this is another example of, of what that would look like. Depending on the number of zones that we have, whether that's each individual span or down to the individual sprinkler level, we can get more of a grid shape like this, and we can get a much more precise uh, uh, prescription map that we can send to the machine. Um, so you know, part of this is going to be driven by you know the the, the area of each of these is going to be driven by you know the size of the zone that we're making, but also the wetted radius of the sprinklers that we have. Um, 
And so we, we can kind of determine the resolution that we're capable of doing. So we can, we can make a map that's really, really accurate, but not, you know, the machine isn't always capable of, of, of doing that. So we want to make sure that we're uh, mindful of that. But this is an example of what that would look like, where we would have certain sprinklers turned on and certain sprinklers turned, turned off. And the sprinklers that are, that are on and off, they will pulse. So they, they'll, they'll still come on um, and putting water down in certain areas of the field unless we have a uh, you know, prescription that says don't, don't put any water down in this spot. Um, and then th that's how they control the amount of water that they're putting down. So there are a few uh, advantages, uh, advantages of VRI that we'll talk about. Um, so one is the potential to comply with future regulations around water quantity and application amounts. Maybe that's fertigation, chemigation, um, groundwater. So there's a lot of different entities that are that are involved in regulating how we're doing irrigation in the state. That could be at the NRD level, the state level, the federal level. Um, having technology and using technology like this uh, like helps us prepare for the future um, and uh, to to address any types of regulations that might come in, uh, at some point. We can do things like improving crop water productivity. So we're putting the right amount of water down in certain areas of the field for that crop. Um, so we're looking at trying to, to improve the, the base of the yield that we're getting per unit of water. So it's more of a water use efficiency or irrigation use efficiency uh, calculation that we can do. Um, and here's, this is what I put, I put may reduce for this, and this is important. Um, it may reduce water use. So I would say that when it comes to variable rate irrigation, reducing the amount of water that you're putting on should not necessarily be the goal. Um, you might do that, and that, that might be a benefit of, of using technology like VRI, uh, but it's also possible that you're going to use the exact same amount of water or even more water than maybe you have historically. What we're looking at trying to do is put the right amount of water down for and tailor it to each individual area of the field. So that, that could be crop need, the soil type. Um, so that's something that's really important to keep in mind, that the end goal should really be increase, increasing efficiency and not necessarily decreasing the amount of water that we're putting down. So there's, there could also be the, the possibility that we may decrease um, some energy use, pumping costs, um, revolutions of a machine around the field. We can possibly reduce things like deep percolation. I think this is a, a benefit that we can realize with technology like VRI, where we're being more mindful of the amount of water that we're putting down, what, what certain areas of the field are capable. You know, I, I, did you guys go through Aaron Hurd's uh, soil health section? So we're looking at what 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 is the soil capable of infiltrating? Um, you know, if if that soil is uh, it's really likely that we're putting down too much too much soil or too much water in certain areas of the field, where we're getting really deep percolation, that could potentially be an issue um, in terms of washing nitrates down uh, into the groundwater. So there's a lot of different things that we want to keep in mind. Um, if we're using something like a VRI prescription, then we can uh, we can know uh, if we're putting down too much water in certain areas and maybe we can back it off. Uh, we can look at things like runoff. So uh, obviously, if, if we have runoff in a field, if we're putting down too much water that a certain soil is capable of infiltrating, that's also an issue. So we want to make sure that we're we're mindful of, of what our soil is capable of doing and putting down the right amount of water. We can look at things like nutrient loss. So, I think it's also a topic that, that Aaron heard uh, probably talk about as well. Um, you know, with, with deep percolation, sometimes we can have nitrates that are going into the groundwater. So using a prescription to help us address uh, issues like that as well. Um, and then, of course, it, it may increase yield. This is not necessarily, I would say, an end goal of, of VRI either, is increasing yield. Um, again, we want to look at more our water use efficiency. But if we're putting down the right amount of water for certain areas of the field for the crop and what it's capable of doing, and that could be a result as well as is increasing our yield, which would definitely be a benefit. Uh, there are some drawbacks to VRI as well. Uh, not everything is great, so this is something that we want to talk about. Uh, the first is that not all fields are a perfect fit for VRI. Some fields are really uniform. They might only have one soil type or maybe two. Um, they might be fairly flat. And so maybe these are, fields aren't our perfect candidates for VRI. You wouldn't necessarily, they wouldn't necessarily pay for the technology that you're putting on. So I think that's something very, uh, that you have to really keep in mind when you're evaluating fields and technology like this is making sure that it's, it's a good fit. There is a higher cost that's involved. So there's more uh, you know, sensors and solenoids and controls that have to be involved to, to do this. And that 
does involve a greater investment in terms of equipment and technology. So uh, you have to make sure that when you're uh, looking at a field, you're looking at whether this is going to pay for itself. Are you going to realize the benefits that you hope to? And this doesn't always necessarily have to be uh, monetary benefits. This could be environmental. So it's just weighing those, uh, weighing those costs. It does involve a greater level of management. So we're having to create prescriptions that we have to send to these machines. We have to understand more information about our field. Um, we also have to have more equipment that we're maintaining. Um, so that, that goes into this next point. There, there is the, the possibility that there will be more maintenance. So we have more technology. Sometimes there's more things that can go wrong that need attention uh, on these machines. We have to, to make sure that they're working correctly. Uh, sometimes there, there can be a perceived uh, or perception that maybe generating some of these pre prescriptions is difficult. Um, it might be starting out you know, a, a process to learn how to do, but we're going to go through with Bruno here in a little bit the, the process of creating a prescription, what that looks like, and how we can actually send, it, send that to the machines. And it's fairly straightforward, and I, I would say that once uh, someone has experience with, with it and doing it a couple times, it's actually a fairly simple process. But it can be a little bit challenging, uh, maybe if you don't have the right uh, folks that are uh, employed at the farm to, to do this, um, first getting started. There are some things maybe around salinity that, that we want to be careful of as well. If we're applying less water in certain areas of the field, maybe we're not getting, we're not flushing the soil. So if we do have any, uh, maybe some salinity issues in, in the water that we're applying, we can see some increases in salinity in certain areas of the field, so that's something to be mindful of, maybe to watch for. Um, so when it comes to variable rate irrigation, uh, there's a few places where it really makes sense. So the first is research plots. Variable rate irrigation for uh, staff at the university makes a lot of sense. This machine here has variable rate irrigation on it, and we have some research plots here. It works great for, for cases like that. Um, it's very easy to make a prescription, to do certain things in the field. Um, addressing variability is another key point for VRI, so that could be soils or topography, um, things like that. Uh, so when we look at soil, we might have differences in texture, maybe organic matter, water holding capacity, topography. We might have higher areas, areas of the field um, where maybe we want, we want to make sure we apply more. Um, those areas might dry out faster. We also might have some low areas in the field where maybe we have ponding issues in certain years. We might have a waterway. Um, that could go through a certain area that we want to exclude and, and not put any water down. Um, we could have some different differences in residue in the field. We could have internal boundaries. So these would be things more like waterways. This could be a drainage ditch. It could be maybe a, a stream or a creek that runs through a field. Um, this is important because in a, in a lot of those types of things, we can't do things like chemigation. So we want to make sure if we're doing chemigating with, with pivots. Um, you know, VRI is a really clear way that we can turn off of, turn off sprinklers as we're going through, something like that. Um, it could be a, a, a big benefit. There could also be some non-crop areas that maybe we want, we want to avoid putting water down, so that would be maybe a pivot road. So if we need to frequently access the, the pivot panel or uh, you know, a tank for fertilizer at the pivot point, if we're irrigating over that, sometimes it can get really muddy or it can get ruts. So having something like VRI where we can just turn off the water over that, over that area and then turn it back on, as it gets back into the field, uh, that can be a really clear benefit. Um, also, if we have cases where we have multiple crops in a field, uh, if, if, let's say we have corn in one side of the field and then wheat on the other, um, and we want to be able to manage those different sides of the field differently. Steve also has some, uh, some examples of some other uh, ways um, that maybe we'll get into in a little bit that, that VRI is, is also really helpful for. Um, so some, in cases where we have um, you know, pivots on corners, and we have two basically in a field that are watering, and there's usually an area where they intersect. So that's another clear area that we can talk about here in a little bit, and, and I'm sure there's a few others. So, um, And then things like variable rate uh, fertilizer. So we can not only, we can maybe not only do water variable rate, um, but we can also look at doing things like chemigating or looking at the amount of nitrate that maybe we do have in the water that we're pumping and, and uh, applying that variable rate, applying that in the field as well. So uh, Jamie talked about some remote sensors using drones, and, and that's one way that we can do that. Another is that we can use things like satellite imagery. We can get very similar data um, from those types of tools as well. Uh, but either way, they provide a unique perspective of the field that we just don't get when you're looking out. So you know, obviously out in this field, there are different plots. There's nitrogen treatments and, and different things going on. When you look at it from here out into the field, it can be really challenging 
to see those differences. I can see some lighter areas here and there, but you can't really see the boundaries. From a drone, you can get a much better perspective. And you would, I would say, if we were to fly this particular field, we would probably see some pretty clear boundaries and outlines of plots that we just can't see from the ground. Um, so that's true as well. When it comes to generating a variable rate prescription map, this type of imagery is very helpful for knowing where we have issues. So for example, this is a field that has two different crops. Um, we also have an area with some ponding and an area that's uh, maybe it's a higher uh, elevation. So maybe we're just not really getting very good uh, growth. Um, but when we use tools like uh, these types of sensors, so like uh, we can do things like color, near infrared, thermal, uh, multispectral, we can get a lot more data to understand uh, what's going on in the field, the, the type of crop stress that we're experiencing, uh, maybe whether that's nitrogen or water, and we can come up with a, and develop a, pre a prescription to help manage that. Um, because of we have a really, you know, an overhead perspective of the field, we can lay that over with some software that Bruno will show us what that looks like, and we can actually generate um, different boundaries and zones that we want to treat differently. So Bruno's going to give us some examples of, of some research that uh, he's helped with, and then we'll get into the process of actually generating a prescription. So my name is Bruno Lina, I'm the extension educator um, uh, located at Columbus in Black County and also I co uh, on top of Black County I cover Boone and Nance. Um, I would say I recently joined the team here I'm, I've been in this position for two months and 15 days today so um, yeah I'm gonna talk a little bit of uh, um, a work that we did in uh, that I collaborated in Alabama before joining extension here so when Steve, Nate, and I were talking on how we would bring a presentation for you guys, we said, okay, let's try to bring some data that could be used to show that there are benefits on using a VRI system. And then I remembered when we were doing this, that is one of the, the, the findings with this on-farm demonstration that uh, I was helping conduct in that, there in Alabama. So this field, as Nate was saying, has a lot of field variability. As you can see here, we have a sandy clay loam, and then as you move south to um, south this field, you change to a sand loam. This is like a beach, beach sand loam. It was super sandy, all uh, sandy all the way to uh, to the uh, to the deep soil level. So what was done here? Because this field has a lot of variability, this field had a uh, variable irrigation system. And then we split in several plots, as you guys can see here, within these zones that were delineated. And then we apply water differently in each of the, those plots based on soil sensor reading. So what we did, we installed soil sensors all over this field based on these areas that would be controlled by Auburn University or using those soil sensors. And the rest of the area was controlled uh, by the farmer. So whatever, whenever the farmer decides to apply water, and then that was the timing for water. He, he would say to us, OK, I want to apply a half an inch all over my area. And then we would take the readings for each sensor and apply that variable um, in a variable rate uh, manner within this field. That allowed us to collect some data set. So this is a corn field and, uh, and data from 2018 and 19. So I, I wanted to focus on those two the uh, areas that I was referring to, the sandy clay loam and the sand areas. These are yield values. The red bars are the values that were uh, gathered based on soil sensor and VR, uh, VRI system. And the blue bars are the numbers uh, that the farmers uh, had based on his irrigation scheduling strategies. As you can see, we had the same amount of, uh, we yield the same, but we yield a little bit on this uh, heavier soil, uh, soil texture, but we yield a little bit higher than the farmer in this uh, sandy area. And the same happened for 2019. When you look only on numbers of yield, you might say, okay, the farmer is doing a, a really good job. But what, mo what I believe is most important is the amount of water that was put on, a on each of those cases. So in here we have what we put on water, so 3.2 in this soil uh, against 4.9, was almost two inch less than what the farmer put out. And But the soil, the sandy soil area that, the, that we have in that field, we apply more. And this pretty much happened for the two growing seasons. 
This is only telling that with the use of soil sensor and a vibrate irrigation system, you can potentially apply more or less water. And going back to what Nate said, you can allocate water within that field and benefit from there. You can sustain yield with lower water amount or you can increase the uh, yield with higher uh, water amount based on soil type. And yeah, here are some, some, of, the, some of the highlights of this. Uh, which I pretty much said. And this is the, I would say, the amount of water, uh, amount of uh, crop produced per, per amount of water that you apply. So this is water use efficiency. On both soil, soil types and both ears, we were able to get higher water use efficiency than the, than the farmer. Meaning that there is, you can, uh, you can use more water but you can yield more, more with this, with less uh, water application. That's pretty much what we're trying to convey here. So that's one of the uh, advantages of using a variable rate irrigation system. Okay. So as uh, Jamie was saying before, uh, based on uh, taking drone images and how we would convert that image into a variable rate irrigation prescription, uh, we Jamie came here last, I would say, last Tuesday. Uh, two, two days ago and then she flew over a field that she collect these uh, drone images and then I'm going to show uh, how we convert that image into a, a vibrate uh, prescription map. So just a little bit brief background information on, the, on this example. So this is a demonstration site I'm currently working on. So in this demonstration site last year we had like 10 treatments set up over uh, 50 plots in 5 reps. So each of the plot here represents one treatment in each rep. And every time one day before the fortification event, we fly the drone over the whole field to, call, to get the NDRE map. And then we calculate the average NDRE map for each plot and calculate the sufficiency index based on the formula here to receive the, um, to help us make the decision if the fortification event will be triggered or not. And this is a thermal information uh, map that can help us to make the irrigation decision. And this is what I took uh, on Tuesday and because the canopy hasn't been closed on that side. So it's kind of not that representative, but we can still uh, read some information from the map here. As we can see here are two creeks near the field. So we can see the temperature is quite low, so which means the water is sufficient in this area. And in our corn field, the color is yellow, so which represents the corn is under water stress. So it's time to put the water stress. All right. So let's go to the actual hands-on on how to bring that this map here into a vibrant uh, irrigation prescription map. So this is one of the softwares. There are, I would say, mainly two of manufacturers that you can use uh, in order to come up with these uh, maps. Uh, uh, and I would say they are fairly similar the way that is, that is done. Each one has its own uh, method or, or technology, but they function pretty much in the same way. So this is one of the examples that we had. So we, you, in this scenario here, we have these people that has seven span and every span has two zones. And, and you can control, you can control every polygon. I, it's quite difficult to see, but every polygon is half span and two degrees angle. So that is the re resolution for this people that you can control every polygon individually based on this resolution. Uh, okay, so in this software, you can uh, select what you want to color and uh, select the percentage rate you would apply on these people. So here's uh, you can you have a few options uh, such as selecting one uh, polygon at a time, or you can do a pizza uh, shape polygon at once, or you can do rings, and then you have the your, the amount of water you want to apply based on those those rates. So what I did was just start coloring that map based on Jamie's uh, map, and then just adding colors for the, those polygons based on those percentage rates. And then I completed this area that uh, uh, we don't have the VRI system because we only have the VRI system at the at this end of the uh, of the pivot. And then I start coloring and trying to match the colors that we had with the map. 
So here I like to go back and forth just to show that depending on where you are, I'm trying to color the map, let's say here, where we have the most red area, here the same, here the same, and then where we have a little bit of, of yellow, and then a in between the yellow and the and the the red. So that's pretty much what I did, and each of those models would have, uh, that has different colors will apply different erasure rates. And at the end, that's what we got. So on the red area was 60%, and on the yellow area was 100 and we have rates in between uh, these percentages the percentage are the, um, um, the percentage amount of the rate you would apply so if you apply one uh, one inch here would have 0.6 and here we'll have one inch that's pretty much the way the systems works uh, once you you generate that map you have to save that map uh, and that's going to create a VRI file. And after that VRI file is created, you still have to, uh, then you have to generate another file, which is a zone file. That is that is the file that's going to be read by the by the panel of the people. So you, there, these are, I would say, the steps. You go to prescription loader, you select the, the VRI file, and then that's going to generate a zone file, which is the file that you're looking at. Once you have that file, you, you would uh, send that file to the panel. So uh, on the same manufacturer that you, you have this control, this remote control, this people, here you would be selecting the rate you want. And once you select the rate, then you, uh, just one example of the rate selected that, that I choose of well, 0.75. And then you send that information to the panel. So the irrigation that's going to apply will be based on that, uh, on that percentage. Then you go to programs and then you go to VRI prescriptions and here's where you upload that dot zone uh, file that the system is going to uh, read, interpret and it's going to do all that magic turning on and off those nozzles based on those uh, that prescription that, that you had that you uploaded. So with that said, uh, that's what we have, that's our presentation and we'd be glad to take questions. Cost wise, I haven't heard lately. Does have you guys heard anything? Mm. Yeah, I'm sure it'd be 40 if you wanted to do the whole machine on top of what what you've got. So they're not if if you want the every sprinkler controlled. Now as we mentioned with the, with the speed control, anybody has got a, a, a computer panel. Now the old basic panels, you know, they just had the timer on them. They can't do that. But but even if you want that, they're three four thousand dollars to get a new panel. So I mean, you can upgrade any pivot. Now the hydraulic ones create a little more of a problem trying to do that but it's still doable and so yeah the cost but if you want to put it on every one is up in that range now sometimes you may not want to put them on every sprinkler right because if you know if the reason you're doing it is that you want to have a uh, not apply water in a certain place as Nate was mentioned if you got like a pivot if we put a pivot on the corner here it would you know it would overlap out into the other machine. So maybe you just put the control valves on the outside two spans, and then when you came by where this sprinkler was at, you'd turn those off and then go on by and turn them back on. And then when you got to the pivot over in that corner, you could do it again. And so it just a lot depends on what you want to do with it. And, and I think that's one thing that, that I wanted to add to here at the end. These, these the equipment is, it's kind of your imagination is a limitation on how you would use them. You know, every field is different. There's some perfect fields out there somewhere, right? That every square foot of soil is the same, and it's got just the perfect slope, so you can drain it, drain it off. You know, the soil's all nice, and, and you know, there's that field somewhere, right? I don't know who owns it, but somewhere that field. But every field has some challenges out there, and so it really makes some sense to, you know, kind of throw the the typical plan away when you're thinking about VRI and say, you know, what does this field need? You know, why might it need a different amount of water here, or you know, we can put different amounts of nitrogen on as well, which is what they're doing here. And you guys heard, heard the job Ed talk about that, how he was variably rate applying because, you know, you keep the concentration of the nitrogen the same in the water, and then you just put on, you know, if you put one inch over here and, and half that much over here, if you put 50 pounds over here, nitrogen, you only put 25 over here. So, you know, depending on where you want to do that, um, you know, that's certainly an option. But, but you know, things like, uh, for that one, uh, and, and I guess if you want to go back to it, that one slide 
that where you were showing the uh, yeah bounce on back to the one that had the looked like a drowned out spot in the yeah it was closer back to the front keep going there that one go back one so this field it's out out uh, east of Grant Nebraska and it's a really, really super flat area, but they don't get a lot of rain. So most years, these kind of areas that, that are just flat and they drowned out, never drowned out, right? So most years they can farm this whole circle and, and everything's happy. But on the years when these drowned out, the variable rate system now, you don't have to put water on these areas. Or in this case, this was wheat. And these areas drowned it out over winter. And so then he came back in, and I think this was corn on this side. So you can see he went back in here and planted in here and over here it looks like uh, you know maybe the wheat wasn't quite as bad but it still wasn't as good and so you know there's all kinds of things that you can do with it you know if you get out in Idaho where they've got really nice ground a lot of places and then they got rock piles that just kind of show up you know just natural out there they don't want to farm the rock piles they can't so they can just skip over those you know there's places in Nebraska where you get a big waterway you know it's just all of a sudden you've got a little canyon that comes up in your field instead of trying to farm through it you know they'll maybe make hay on that and it's just grass and so they don't want to irrigate it necessarily the same as a crop so you can make that spot so there's you know kind of the the you know your imagination's a limit on what you can use some of this equipment for beyond what we talked about and that's really what it was designed for was with changes in you know soil types and putting different amounts of fertilizer and some of that on but so you know I guess that's a long ways to say that I don't know exactly what it costs you know that's kind of where this started right but it depends on what you're doing with it and, and what you're wanting to put on it, it really is pretty neat I mean it, the pivot's been considered or called many times the erector set of the farm right if anybody's old enough to remember what an erector set is but uh, you know you you know you've seen him show up on the truck that's a pile of pieces you know you buy a new tractor or a combine it all shows up assembled but a pivot they put it together and a lot of that's because of course it's too big to haul down the road very easy but a lot of that's because every machine's a little bit custom you know the the length is different or the span lengths are different depending on what you need to skip over a, a crick or something uh, you know some got a corner machine on them others have I mean most all of them will have a different sprinkler package on them and so they're just really customized machines and and this is the same way you can customize it at any level you want to That grow in particular, he was a little bit hesitant on making changes. So he saw the benefit, he was willing to change a little bit. But in my opinion, what comes down to that field that has a lot of variability is really hard to find how, how a farmer is going to install 19 sensors, 10 sensors, or 20 sensors in a field to control that. That's going to add costs. But the main point is that he, he saw the differences and he, he knew that that area for the sandy area, and as you guys saw, hardly ever they're, they're going to be able to, to build more than 120, 150 because it's too sandy and then he has to cover all, the entire people. So yeah, we gain a lot of, he, got, he gained a lot of information from that field and he was willing to change, but he was still a little bit of hesitant. Okay, yeah, it's nice because that fits some needs based on the field, but it's still, we, need, we still need to work a little bit on that aspect. That's my opinion. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, oftentimes when I've worked with farmers and, and you know, you show them a couple of years what can be done and, and they often change quite a bit, you know, because they just, you know, once you see it on your own farm, it's, it's really more believable or once you even see it in your neighborhood. And that's the reason we're out here doing these you know, in this part of Nebraska is, that, you know, this isn't where we have a university research official facility, but once you do something here, it's kind of unique, and, and uh, once you see it here, then people are a lot more likely to, to uh, you know, take that results more at face value for their region. You know, it still boils down to irrigation scheduling. You know, we've talked about irrigation scheduling when, uh, before I was born, I think, at the university. You know, they start talking about that back in the 50s, you know, when, uh, with, you know, when, how, how do you know when to start the irrigation system for the season and how much do you put on each week? And that's still what this boils down to. And at some level, when you go to this variable rate stuff, and now we've got multiple zones out there, it really you know, makes it worse than it was before because now instead of making a decision for one part of the field, you got to make a decision for, you know, 
time or how many zones that you put out there. And so that's still kind of the crux of the deal. And, uh, you know, I, I love to talk about irrigation scheduling. And if anybody wants to talk about that, we'd be more than happy to do that today. There's a lot of different ways that are being done and looked at right now. You know, this was one where we take a look at some imagery that was gathered with a drone. There's some satellite things going on that helps with that. Of course, the soil water sensor world is, has, you know, got lots and lots of companies in it now. We still have a lot of crop consultants that feel pretty comfortable going out with a hand probe and, you know, checking the field and, and uh, seeing what's going on with it. All of those are better than doing nothing. This uh, past winter, I uh, finished up for this spring. Uh, we get Sam down in the, the uh, upper big blue NRD area and we've gotten some data from them or I have an, an extension from farmers that they require areas where their nitrate levels are going up to turn in a log from a like well what uh, Javed was showing with that blue box uh, or some soil water monitoring system and the thing that I thought was interesting is that you know first off you know you can I guess you could use the state that you know you can lead a horse to water but you can't make them drink because a lot of these farmers even though they were required to have that still didn't look at the data very well and, and make some decisions that were pretty pretty obvious that they could have made. The other thing that I'll, I'll just tell you, you know, that I observed from that was that people tend to irrigate about the same amount of water every year, whether it's a wet year or a dry year. And on the wetter years, they over-irrigated more. This past year was pretty dry down there and there were some fields, maybe 15 or 20 percent of them that probably could use a little extra water at the end because it was really dry. And so I think it really emphasizes the point that, you know, it's, 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 uh, you've got to fly by the instruments with irrigation scheduling. I mean, you've got to have some means to see what's going on out there. It's not, your gut feel just isn't good enough. And I think a lot of guys, you know, my observation has been, well, they probably enough water out there, but they go ahead and put another one on or a little quicker than they would just because they're not quite sure. And so it's kind of insurance. And, and I think that's just the way it is. When you're not quite sure, you go ahead and, you know, you don't want a problem out there. The other thing that I observed from that, and I've seen this uh, all along as well, is that towards the end of the season, guys always tend to put on a little too much water at the end of the season. And I think that's kind of because in the middle part of the summer, you know, it can be, you know, some weeks can maybe use two inches of water in a week. And then as the days are getting shorter and, and uh, it's getting cooler, you don't need that much. In fact, by towards the end of the season, it may be down to where you only need close to an inch per week. And yet guys have kind of got themselves you know, in the mode, putting that uh, given amount of water, and so they kind of keep keep going with that. Um, and so then they always end up with the field pretty wet at the end of the year. And when we take a look at nitrates, I think that really is a key thing. Because I see a lot of these fields, um, you know, guys are pulling the stuff out by about the middle of September, but a lot of those fields just were, were pretty wet at the end of the year. You know, they probably, even though that's, you know, if, if, if you want to see where really great fields are down in that, you know, York, Aurora area, along the interstate there, you know, that's that silt loam soil that's really deep and, and uh, holds a lot of water. And still, a lot of those soils are still only being able to hold maybe an inch or two of water before they were filled with that. So typically we'll get that much water in the fall, so that all the moisture comes over the winter and into the spring is going to deep percolate below the root zone. And if there's some carryover nitrogen or some that's mineralized out, it's going to carry it with it. And that's the reason that we really try to emphasize so much about timing on nitrogen fertilizer because we kind of think about over irrigating but we don't really sometimes think about it in that 365 day out of the year perspective because in the springtime I doubt there's a field in the state of Nebraska that doesn't get above field capacity even when you get to the panhandle where they only get 14 inches of rain because we just leave we just have to leave the fields pretty wet I mean even if we dry them as much as you know, the university recommendation on a good silt loam soil, it's only about five inches. On a field like this, if we get it that dry, it's probably still only about two inches or three maybe. And so, you know, we just get so much off-season precipitation in the spring, we can't hold it and it's going to go down. And so we really need to think about that from a nitrogen perspective that we have to um, not only think about irrigation scheduling and leaching that way, but also the moisture that we get from off-season because that's just a, a really critical aspect. So I've done way too much talking here.